Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Royal Watcher podcast. My name is Saad Salman. I am the founder and editor of the Royal Watcher, a royal commentator, and a royal contributor for Alt.com. And my name is Sam Gillespie. I am the editor of The Beaumont. I have a background in fine jewelry and a long held fascination with history and royalty. And welcome back to another episode on the Royal Watcher podcast. Today, we're talking about kind of some events that have been happening in the past few weeks. Uh, one of the major ones has been the Luxembourg New Year's reception, which kind of ties in with our last episode on the New Year's receptions in Denmark and Japan and in Spain. And we're also going to talk about the Dutch royal family's tour of the Caribbean. Yes, been a very uh, couple, a, ni- a nice break from all the from all the British royal news for everyone. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to start with kind of talking about Luxembourg in uh, at the end of January. So they had their annual New Year's reception, which they're calling it annual, but this is only the second time that it's happened. They started the event back in 2020 because usually they used to have a big white tie gala at the end of their National Day celebrations in June. And they thought it was maybe a bit too much events because there's a parade there, there's a church service. I think there's a perception as well. So it's too many events. And they decided to kind of replace that annual gala and have it at New Year's in which to invite diplomats, the government, religious figures, and have a gala dinner at the Grand Ducal Palace. Oh, that's interesting. I did wonder why they'd suddenly brought it in. I thought maybe it had something to do with COVID or, you know, just, but it's nice to see that, you know, they can modernize these uh, traditional events when, when they want to, when they deem, you know, the previous traditions not, not as necessary anymore. Definitely. And this way we kind of have a nice gala at the start of the year and in June, because there's already so much stuff happening at that time, it allows them to kind of focus on the other events for National Day much better. Yeah, and it gives us something to talk about throughout the year. So this year, uh, Grand Duke Henri and the Grand Duchess were joined by all five of their children and one of their daughter-in-laws for this gala, and it was quite a mixed turnout in that sense. Oh, oh, um, how come? It was basically, uh, so the first reception, which happened in 2020, just had the Grand Duke the hereditary Grand Duke and Grand Duchess and Prince Alexandra. So we kind of had no expectation of what's going to happen. And then this time uh, we had the Grand Duchess and also Prince Felix, Prince Lou, Prince Sebastian, but no Princess Claire, who's Prince Felix's wife. And it was a kind of difference in dress codes where you see some of the men are in uniform and some are in white tie, which I mean, they haven't served in the military, so that kind of makes sense. And then the ladies are all in gowns and a mixed bag of tiaras as well. With Luxembourg, you never really know. They sometimes have a hierarchy and sometimes just kind of pull whatever's there. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe they're still working out the uh, the finer details and they're just sort of uh, making up as they go along. Definitely. I think there's no set rules like we were watchers like. So starting with the Grand Duchess, she wore this kind of lovely caped gown with the Belgian scroll tiara, which is one of the wedding gifts to her mother-in-law, Grand Duchess Josephine Charlotte. And it was almost auctioned after the uh, Joseph and Charlotte's death. But in recent years, it's become Maria Teresa's favorite tiara. She's worn, I think, almost at every gala except one in the past decade. Yeah, no, it's a very nice piece. I mean, like, like you say, the Luxembourg um, royal jewels are a bit of a mixed bag. They're either very small sort of necklaces that have been converted into tiaras or way too big for um grand duchess maria such as the uh luxembourg empire tiara so yeah i think it's nice that she's she's found some one that's sort of in the middle that re- really actually suits her suits her head her head shape definitely and for it's i think one of my most like favorite modern tiaras because of the way kind of it looks it has a modern look but it also doesn't look as striking as kind of some of the contemporary tiaras we see popping up mm, definitely yeah, and so it was a lifelong favorite of her mother-in-law, and it was loaned to her sister-in-law, Princess Sibylla, back in 2002. But since then, it's only been worn by the Grand Duchess, and we see kind of how um, she's really made it her own. With the tiara, she was wearing her um, Order of the Order of the Luxembourg uh, Lion, I believe. Is it the Golden Lion? I think it's... A Golden Lion, yes. Yeah. And so that is the highest order. Um, and 
Maria Theresa is the only member of the family married in who has it because she is the Grand Duchess. Mm. As we see in the next slide, um, the Hervey Grand Duchess only has the smaller order, which is the order of Adolf of Nassau, who was kind of the founder of this branch of the Luxembourg Grand Ducal Dynasty. Okay, and do you think just perhaps because it's quite? I mean, Lux, when was Luxembourg founded? It's it's a very new country, so you know maybe it was you know, yeah. So you think about it. So Luxembourg was technically founded in um, it's a pretty ancient country, but it used to be a part of the Netherlands, uh, and it was kind of ruled by the Dutch royal family until the eighteen nineties, and since then it's been um, owned by and uh, ruled by a different branch of the family. Uh, because of male line primogeniture and all of that kind of complication. So um, they brought their own orders, but they're still closely related in a sense to the Dutch Royals as well. Mm, yes. And the Belgians. And the Belgians. Yeah. But that's through kind of married rather than dynastic. Yes. That's very true. So, yeah. And the Hereditary Grand Duchess wore the Aquamarine tiara, as you were saying, this one is actually a bracelet converted into tiara. And this was another one of those pieces acquired by Josephine Charlotte in the 1950s, which has these kind of really massive square aquamarines. Mm, yeah, very similar to uh, Queen Elizabeth's aquamarines, I'm just noticing. Just, you know, the the emerald cut, which is like a rectangular cut, um, with its shapes. So, yeah, yes. there, are, there are, are other cuts to aquamarines, but hey-ho. <laughs> I believe these would have been Brazilian aquamarines as well. And yeah. I'm not really sure that we know the provenance of these pieces, but they were acquired in the 50s. Um, Josephine Charlotte did have kind of relations in Brazil, especially in the royal family, but then they were also massively wealthy, so they could have acquired it through any means. Yes. And so with that, the, uh, her grand duchess wore a seraphine maternity gown. And of course, we've already talked about her order. And moving on to the third royal lady is Prince Alexandra, who kind of gave the biggest surprise tonight, which was wearing the Luxembourg Chaumet Emerald Tiara for the first time, along with the family's antique emerald earrings and their big emerald bangle. Yes, and I must say, it's definitely grown on me, this tiara. It is, it's, it's, I would say it was my favorite. In the, I do like the Luxembourg Empire tiara, but it is, it's enormous. But this one is, yeah, it's growing on me. So it's an art deco piece um, made by Chaumet, I believe, in the uh, 19... Tw- no, not 1920. It was made, I believe it was uh, Christmas 1924. Okay, well, I was close then. Yeah. So, yeah, so it huge, was, yeah, beautiful piece. Beautiful art deco piece made by Chaumet, who happened to make um, pretty much some of the best tiaras owned by royal families. And I believe this was initially... Um, made for Grand Duchess Charlotte. Um, yes, she, it was. She, and then during World War II, because she became such an iconic figure and her portraits were kind of spread all around the US and the UK, and this tiara supposedly inspired the tiara of Wonder Woman. Yeah, I've, I've heard that one. Um, I mean, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely a striking piece, and kind of for Alexandra, who's going to be getting married in April. It's one of the more major pieces from the Grand Ducal collection that she's worn. Mm, very much so. I mean, I wouldn't, mm, probably wouldn't be a wedding tiara. What do you think? If she's worn uh, it, probably not. If she's worn it before her wedding, I know that people usually like to surprise us on their wedding days. She's probably not going to wear it again, but you never know. You never know. Yeah, you never know. I mean, I don't think it's been used as a wedding tiara yet, but it would be quite striking if it was. Yeah. And I kind of really want to see this one worn by the Hurry Grand Duchess at some point because I think it really kind of suit her general look um, and the way like she was. And, but in this picture, you can really see Alexandra looks quite like her grandmother, Josephine Charlotte. Mm, yes, very much around the, uh, around the jawline. Yeah. And she's wearing, along with all the jewels, is an Oscar de la Renta cape gown. Mm. So this kind of ends up our roundup of the Luxembourg New Year's reception. What were your thoughts, Sam? I think it's wonderful. I mean, you know, as I said in the beginning, the fact that they are, like, I thought they they had started this tradition because of COVID and obviously social distancing and the amount of people that you can have, or you used to be able to have, in one room. Um, but if it's a case of them wanting to sort of modernise um, 
an an older tradition and you know make it uh it, I don't know what's the word like more practical more streamlined um so that you have more events throughout the year so that more people can attend I think that's fantastic and you know it's a good example of you know as much as something is tradition it can be tweaked and changed yeah definitely I think it's a really good way to kind of distribute stuff and not be so kind of burden on one day and this way we kind of have a new occasion to look forward to with tiaras yes and we all love a tiara occasion definitely and then moving on so the dutch royal family have been on a massive tour of the caribbean they're still on the tour so it's continuing and it's been quite fun to watch because it's the first time that the princess of orange um, the dutch crown princess has joined her parents on the tour to the caribbean territories of the kingdom of the netherlands Mm, yes and i think as we can see from these photos if you do watch our youtube channel they are having a blast yes i think um the dutch royal family themselves are really popular in the caribbean territories and you can really see that they enjoy themselves they have massive support and really um if you can see that they have a fun blast especially with the traditional um kind of ceremonies they have in those territories mm, very much very uh, nice to see uh i think we if we've all seen the clip uh queen maxima she can move that girl's got moves yeah i think we'll include that clip at some point in our videos mm -hmm. as well so yeah for those watching on youtube you'll have a chance to see that yeah so family they started the trip on the island of Bonaire uh, with, where they were welcomed by the lieutenant governor and then they had a series of visits on the first day in which they started by visiting slave huts really addressing the legacy of colonialism head on and then they had a series of kind of cultural visits they went to a nature sanctuary and it was really a broad visit in that sense where they try to bring in all aspects of kind of the Dutch legacy in the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, unfortunately, given the bad PR from the British, uh, the last British royal tour of the Caribbean, I think these, you know, you, it's, these things have to be addressed. And like you say, they have to be addressed head on. So, you know, it's a very, it's a nice example to see that the Dutch are doing that. Yeah. And the Dutch have been really uh, tackling this issue. I think a few weeks ago it was announced that the king has, um, commission an independent kind of group of researchers to look into the legacy of slavery into the house of orange and their fortune and just a few weeks ago the dutch prime minister also apologized for slavery in kind of a very finite way than most other countries have done so they really are it's at the forefront of what their legacy is oh well that's fantastic that's a really good example to that uh, they're setting Definitely. And then, so this was the first day, and then in the evening, they had a big visit to this Taste of Bonaire market, and they saw kind of taste local foods, saw music performances, and you can see, for those watching on YouTube, that in the back, you, the sun is setting, and they're on this Caribbean island, so it seems like a really fun time. Yeah, it's not your trip. I mean, I don't know that the you know, other royal families do a fun when they go on on tour, but they do seem to be more um, what's the word accessible than perhaps Definitely. other royal families. But they're still very regal, which is very nice. Yeah, and like we were talking about here, so I kind of a start with the fashion that on the first day the fashion. I think we can see the king's looks change. Uh, more than ladies, but Queen Maxima is kind of sticking true to her kind of queenly style, wearing a hat and everything. But the Princess of Orange started off in a dress, and then she's worn kind of a um, range of different outfits throughout the tour. Yeah, and um, yeah, she's one of my favorite royals to watch, sort of up and coming. And I love her fashion sense. It's you know, it's very relaxed, but like I say, very regal too. Definitely, yeah. 
And then Maxima's fashion can sometimes be hit or miss, but when the royals arrived in Aruba the following day, it was, I think, a hit on all fronts, where oh, I yeah. really love the Prince of Orange's suit, but also Maxima's hat, um, dress, and the brooch. And the brooch and the earrings and the ruby earrings. Oh, it all goes together. Love it. So Maxima wore the brooch of the Dutch ruby peacock terror, and then she had a outfit change a few hours later and wore kind of I believe those are citrine jewels, which are kind of modern pieces in her collection. Yeah, and a little bit more, um, quote unquote, casual. <laughs> than BBP. But then you can see Maxima's wearing a really lovely dress and a hat as well. So casual for Maxima, but not yeah. for Maxima. Yeah, she puts us all to shame. Definitely. And you can see the king also had a bit of an outfit change. Yeah. Though his Caribbean wardrobe could require a bit more help, in my opinion. It could, yeah. But I mean, come on, how hot is it? I mean, I know it's February, but like, what's the temperature? <laughs> Probably not too cool. Mm. So, no, he seems to be having fun. That evening, they attended this big festival. Um, uh, actually, uh, it was the following evening, sorry. Um, at, called the Bon Bini Festival at Fort Zutman in which they had a full kind of exploration of uh, Aruban culture history through music and dance. Oh, lovely. And you can see um, kind of a glimpse of Maxima and the King dancing, and this is where we'll include the video as well. Yes, I'll put a little short clip on. And like I say, she yeah. can move. She can move. And <laughs> Maxima actually wore this dress uh, for a kind of infamous video that was leaked a few years ago of her doing the flamenco which kind of got a lot of criticism from certain segments of the press. Why? And so it's nice to see her kind of bringing it back for another dancing event. Oh, why can't she dance the flamenco? She's got Argentinian background. I know. It was it, not from Dutch people. It was from other segments of well, Twitter. Well, there's always some, isn't there? There always is. And then at the same time, you can look at the Princess of Orange and her kind of wardrobe is very different from mother in which she's wearing this poncho style thing and i've i've really got uh elements where i f- saw her resemblance to princess beatrice and you can see kind of how she's channeling that kind of stability and beatrix herself is very popular in the caribbean territories mm. so very interesting mm. so the dutch moved on the next day they traveled by uh kind of navy ship to the island of curacao i believe them i hope i'm pressed i have no idea correctly. if we if we did it wrong <laughs> please please correct us in the comments <laughs> all right everyone uh but they arrived and they had a kind of really lovely official welcome and that was the first day and then the next day was um the king and queen's 21st wedding anniversary oh so you can see them on the left over here for everyone watching on youtube they tied a lock on to a monument as a symbol of their love and it was really quite lovely and that evening there was a dinner held for 21 citizens of Aruba uh or sorry Curacao which kind of symbolized the 20 their 21st anniversary and you can see kind of different looks again on the two ladies well how romantic so quite lovely and then the next day they kind of began with this visit to a plantation where again they saw kind of how slavery played a part in kind of the legacy of the island and then there was a visit to um i believe a beach where they saw the preservation of turtles oh oh uh, yes of course i remember seeing that video of um uh, katarina amalia with the turtle yeah <laughs> yeah so definitely kind of looking for uh at really different aspects of kind of legacy of decolonization and then nature conservation plus a series of official ceremonies and then cultural events like that evening when there was a tamba music concert with carnival performances and you can see again it's a whole different look and i have to say these are my so far i think favorite looks of the tour and they all look so kind of in their own element and very relaxed and glad to see the king has a white slash cream suit on yes it's, it goes very nicely with the sunburn i can see yeah and i mean <laughs> the whole kind of i really like when they were kind of gowns and stuff on these caribbean tours because it makes it seem a bit more formal than kind of just normal clothes of this i'm 
this is right up my alley. Yeah, lovely. No, it's it seems like it's a, like I say, very um, relaxed and accessible, but at the same time, still sort of keeping it official. Yeah, definitely. And so this is the tour so far. Um, from this is they've visited three nations, and then from Monday, we're recording on a Sunday for everyone watching, and they'll move on to St. Martin, St. Eustace, and Saba for the final leg like, of their tour, which ends on the 9th of February. Wow, that's a really, that's quite a long tour. I mean, you know, with British ones, you usually get about a week, don't you? Definitely, yeah. I think this is one of those longest ones where, because it's an introductory tour for Amalia, they're taking their time trying to yeah. get through it. making sure everyone sees her, making sure she understands the issues. And um, yeah, I mean, one thing you were telling me before we started recording was the fact that the the Dutch monarchy itself is actually quite popular within these um, these territories. Definitely, yeah. I think uh, we have a friend, Brigitte, on TikTok who's kind of talked about how even though she's not a big fan of the monarchy, that the Dutch roles are really popular and there's so many benefits to um, the monarchy that the islands, not just monarchy, but having that link to the Netherlands because these are not former colonies. These are technically active parts of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Three of them are um, basically districts of the Netherlands. And three others are independent kind of countries within the kingdom of the Netherlands. So there's different kind of legal relationships, but they all kind of benefit from being a part of the Netherlands. They have resources, kind of EU citizenship and that sort of stuff. Fantastic. That's so interesting. And again, something I I never knew that they were. um, So you could say, you know, would it be like in Denmark where she, well, Queen Margaretha is also queen of, is she still queen of Greenland? Yes, and the Faroe Islands. And the Faroe Islands. So could it is it is it a case of King King Wilhelm being the king of the Netherlands, Aruba, St. Martin? Yes, I think oh. that is the legal kind of terminology. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Wow, didn't know. And and as you say, there's actually um is actually support for, for still being um, you know, within this uh sort of union with the Netherlands. Yes. But at the same time, there were kind of several um, small scale protests to this visit and how kind of it's been um, treated in a sense. But an element of that was really kind of talking about the colonial legacy and addressing those issues rather than wanting to kind of um, really just get away from them and then just take them, make themselves kind of independent. Independent. Oh, okay. yeah. well, that's interesting. Yeah. So I think this is the conclusion of our episode this week. So what were your thoughts so far, Sam? Uh, it's a good start to the year. And I must say it's been an, that was quite a nice palate cleanser from um, the uh, the fallout from Spare, which I'm kind of bored with now, kind of bored with. <laughs> I'm with you on that. And for those wondering, uh, we will have an episode on King Constantine's funeral up in a few weeks uh, when there's going to be a memorial service so we'll kind of round it all up in one episode yes very much and i'm looking forward to that one i've been preparing yes wonderful thank you everyone for listening yep thank you bye